Hello and welcome to our London History Podcast, where we share our love of London, its people, places and history in weekly 20-minute episodes. I am your host, Hazel Baker, qualified London tour guide and CEO of London Guided Walks. You can follow us on Twitter at guided underscore walks or find us on Instagram at walk underscore London. Or indeed, we're also on Facebook and we're called London Guided Walks. We have lots of lovely guided walks and private tours and treasure hunts and virtual tours for Londoners and visitors alike. You can check out all of those on our website, londonguidedwalks.co.uk. Also on our website, we have a blog which is regularly updated by our passionate team of qualified London tour guides. And there are hundreds, literally hundreds of blog posts, all London history related um, for you to choose from. And they're all absolutely free. And don't forget also with show notes, particularly this episode as well, Each episode has uh, show notes with links to further reading or images, and this one's got quite a few of those. So make sure you have a look at that all on our website, londonguidedwalks.co.uk forward slash podcast. Right, let's get on with the show. If you have ever walked along the South Bank between Shakespeare's Globe and Borough Market, then you would have walked under Southwark Bridge. In the pedestrian underpass, you may have noticed five large pieces of slate along the southern wall. And these slates have been engraved by artist Richard Kinsley, who also did the Seven Stages of Man, which can be seen at BT um, Baynard's house in Blackfriars. And it shows a scene of long-lost London event, the Frost Fair. The slate engravings show a map of the area surrounding the section of frozen River Thames with fun pictures of the impromptu market stalls and Londoners having a gay old time. The River Thames froze solid numerous times between 1309 and 1814. Charles Mackay in The Thames and its Tributaries 1840 lists the Thames freezing over 12 times between 250 AD and 1114, but he fails to share his sources. Convenient, that. In 1309, the Chroniques to London describes the Great Freeze. There was such cold and such masses and piles of ice on the Thames and everywhere else that the poor were overcome by excessive cold. And bread covered with straw or otherwise protected was frozen so that it could not be eaten unless warmed. The crust of ice on the Thames was so thick that men could travel to London from Queen Hythe and Southwark and Westminster. And it lasted so long that people put a piece of leather in the middle and wrestled on it by a fire they made and caught a hare on the Thames with dogs. London Bridge only survived after great danger and damage. We know that between 1309 and 1814, the River Thames froze at least 23 times. But why did the River Thames freeze over? And just to be clear, it wasn't the whole of the River Thames that froze. It was just a particular section between Blackfriars Bridge and the Old London Bridge. And that was susceptible to freezing. The Old London Bridge, 1176 to 1825, acted as a weir and more or less prevented tides and the salt water passing that point. And also with the number of piers on this bridge, 19 in total, it slowed the Thames down, um, which enabled the Thames to freeze. In our episode number 35, A Tudor Christmas, you might remember me mentioning about the Little Ice Age. This refers to a period between the 14th and the 19th centuries where the climate in Europe and North America cooled dramatically. Winters became colder and weather more extreme. Storms, gales, weeks of rain and the aftermath of floods and long droughts became all too common. The year 1816, for example, is known as the year without a summer. Low temperatures and heavy rains ruined the harvests and caused widespread famine and assisted a typhoid epidemic. In 1564-65, both Stowe and Hollingshead report a very severe winter, where at New Year's, the River Thames was frozen over from London Bridge to Westminster. And it's during the same year that Elizabeth I is reported to have won at Targets, which is archery on the ice. What was a frost fair? Well, in modern terms, a pop-up. 
The first time we see the term frost fair being used is in 1608, and there were events on the frozen Thames before that. In 695 AD, the Thames was frozen for six weeks when booths were erected and a market held on the ice. The term frost fair just wasn't used. The frost fair offered plenty of attractions, including a whole ox roasted on the ice, stilt walking, the hunting of a fox or a hare, and even a printing press provided people with a souvenir of their visit. Charles II's visit was recorded with a printed memento, which is now in the Museum of London Archives, and I'll provide a link for that. What would going to a frost fair be like? Well, a London street, in effect, just on ice. It was known as Froseland, alias Blanket Fair. And you can see this in an engraving printed by G. Croom at the Blue Ball Street over against Baynard's Castle in 1684. And in this picture, you can see people skating, walking the dog, playing nine-pin skittles, uh, boats with wheels being pulled by watermen, horses and carriages, and even football being played on the ice. And there's a fabulous description of the events at the bottom of the image. This place, the pastime use of football yields. The common hunt here makes another show, as he to hunt and hare is wont to go. But though no woods are here, or hares to fleet, yet men do often foxes catch and meet. Into an hole here one by chance doth fall, at which the watermen begin to bawl, What, will you rob our cellar of its drink, when he, alas, poor man, no harm did think? Here men, well mounted, do on horses ride, here they do throw at cocks as a trove tide. A chariot here so cunningly was made that it did move itself, without the aid of horse or rope, by virtue of a spring that Vulcan did contrive who wrought therein. The rooks at nine holes here do flock together as they are wont to do in summer weather. Three haperth for a penny, here they cry, of gingerbread, come, who will of it buy? This is the booth where men did money take, for crepe and ribbons that they there did make. But in six hours this great and rare show of booths and pastimes all away did go. If you want to get a sense, and I mean only a vague sense, of what the last frost fair of 1814 may have been like, then you can take a few minutes and watch Doctor Who, Series 10, Episode 3. And this is where Doctor Who parks his TARDIS in 1814 on Blackfriars Bridge and along with his companion Clara enjoy the delights of the frost fair. Culinary delights on offer include tasty ox cheek, Lapland mutton roasted on a spit on the ice and juicy sheep hearts. For entertainment, there's a sword eater, some exotic looking wrestlers, a hoop game, gambling opportunities with the soldiers playing cards. There are many historical inaccuracies in this short clip, but I won't bore you with those. I just need to remind myself that it is what it is, a form and entertainment with a nod to the past. But if you'd like to see the clip, I've embedded it in my show notes, londonguidedwalks.co.uk forward slash podcast. Many of the paintings and engravings that you see, they show a very smooth surface of ice. But of course, this is the River Thames that we're talking about. It would have been very different in real life. It would have been a jumbled mass of ice, one huge block on top of the other. A wonderful example of this can be seen in an oil and canvas painting by Abraham Hondius entitled A Frost Fair on the Thames at Temple Stairs, which is in the Museum of London's permanent collection. It shows coaches, sledges and sedan chairs on the ice while a game of nine pins is in progress in the central foreground. It shows people strolling on the ice and avoiding a huge gaping hole in the right foreground. 
Among the buildings in the background, you can see St. Clement's Danes, Essex buildings, Middle Temple Hall, Temple Stairs and King's Bench Walk. It also gives us a very clear view of what the old London Bridge would have looked like. And I've included a link in the show notes. You might think with this little ice age that frost fairs were a common occurrence, but that's simply not true. There are some years that the Thames did freeze over, but there wasn't a frost fair. For example, in the winter months of 1775 to 76, there was a flu epidemic, killing near to 40,000 people in London. In the winters of 923, 1150 and 1410, chroniclers record hundreds of loaded horse carts travelling back and forth along the frozen River Thames. But there's not a single record of any frost fair having taken a place in the same years. So how do we know when frost fairs occurred? Well, we have evidence in contemporary paintings, prints and chronicles on several occasions. And when a sustained period of cold weather plus economical and public health issues have allowed it, frost fairs on the river have taken place. This includes the years 1683, 1715, 1739, 1789 and the very last frost fair of 1814. Which was London's most famous frost fair, I hear you ask? Arguably, the most famous of them all was that from 1683 to 84. The Great Frost of this year was unparalleled in the city's history and began at the start of December, continuing over Christmas and through until the 4th of February 1684. And they are the coldest three months on record. The Thames froze for nearly two months, alongside milk in dairies and ink in pots. The poor were particularly affected by the climate, as they were no longer able to get food um, or supplies, and also they struggled to keep warm. The earliest chronology is given by Charles Mackay in The Thames and its Tributaries in 1840. And this shows 10 verses in letterpress with a border printed on the Thames. And it is this which Richard Kinsley, the artist, has used in his artwork under Southwark Bridge. Behold the liquid Thames now frozen o'er, that lately ships of mighty burden bore. The watermen, for want of rowing boats, make use of booths to get their pence and groats. Here you may see beef roasted on the spit, and for your money you may taste a bit. There you may print your name, though cannot write, cause numbed with cold. Tis done with great delight, and lay it by that ages yet to come may see what things upon the ice were done. The London Picture Archive has a fabulous engraving of the River Thames 1683-84 to Frost Fair and it shows wonderful display of people eating, drinking and using entertainment booths which stretch across the ice. You can see figures travelling by horse-drawn coach, skates, boats with wheels and boats transformed into sledges. The item has been divided into 45 playing cards with instructions in the margins. And these cards were printed in 1716, so it goes to show that the Frost Fair of 1683-84 was a talking point for many a year. And I'll share with you the link of this engraving in the show notes. At the bottom of this picture is an alphabetical explanation of, and I quote, the most remarkable figures so you can see what is going on. And here we have a lottery booth, a silversmith booth, a chop house and a coffee house, and boys sliding, and leather bottle booths, as well as a drum booth and also a toy shop. A full account of the severe weather of 1863 is given in a sheet preserved in the British Museum, printed for J. Howe at the Coaches and Horses without Bishopgate Street in 1684, and it's entitled A Strange and Wonderful Relation of Many Remarkable Damages Sustained Both at Sea and Land by the Present Unparalleled Frost. 1608 was remarkable for a great frost. 
The 8th of December began a hard frost and continued until the 15th of the same and then thawed. And then the 22nd of December, it began again. Again to freeze violently, so as diverse persons went halfway over the Thames upon the ice. And the 30th of December, at every ebb, many people went quite over the Thames in diverse places, and so continued from that day until the 3rd of January. The people passed daily between London and the bankside at every half ebb, for the flood removed the ice and forced the people daily to tread new paths, except only between Lambeth and the ferry at Westminster, the which, by incessant treading, became very firm and free passage until the great thaw. And from Sunday the 10th of January until the 15th of the same, the frost grew so extreme as the ice became firm and removed not. And then all sorts of men, women and children went boldly upon the ice in most parts. Some shot at pricks, others bowled and danced with other variable pastimes. By reason of which concourse of people, there were many that set up booths and standings upon the ice as fruit sellers, victuallers that sold beer and wine, shoemakers and a barber's tent, etc. And this can be found in Edmund Howe's continuation of the abridgment of Stowe's English Chronicle. And he adds that all of the shops were temporary and they had fires in every single one of them. And that the frost even killed all the artichokes in the gardens about London. The ice lasted until the afternoon of the 2nd of February when it was quite dissolved and clean gone. So you might think, why does the River Thames not freeze anymore? Well, one of the reasons why it did in the first place is because of the old London Bridge, remember, and that was demolished in 1831. And the new design had a lot fewer arches and therefore it allowed the Thames to flow freely, unlike the old London Bridge. Another reason is industrialisation that played a part too. The arrival of power stations along the Thames made it sure that the water would never cool down enough to freeze ever again. And also the Thames had been embanked. These are embankments forcing the river to be narrower and therefore deeper and faster than ever before. I hope it's given you a little bit of a taste of what the frost fairs were all about. And thank you so much for all of your suggestions on future episodes. I am creating a very long list and intend to do them all. Now, if you are able to share your love of London and our London History podcast, it would be very much appreciated. And you can do that several ways. One, by leaving a review. They are always appreciated, whether that is the five star tick or writing some words and sharing the bits that you love. Also, if you have friends, family or even, I dare say, colleagues who uh, would appreciate uh, this podcast, then share, share away. Thanks for listening and I'll see you next week.